Hello, and welcome to the premiere episode of Hip Hop State of Mind. We are broadcasting from New York City. My name is Rosa Clemente, and I'm your host and executive producer. Our editor is Rebecca B. Fresh McDonald. Our webmaster and social media coordinator is Vin Lam Jap. And our news correspondent is Dr. Jared Ball. We're so excited to be part of the Free Speech TV family and hope to see you all in our future travels. Just a little bit about me. I was born in the South Bronx. At the age of seven, I moved from the Bronx to Elmsford, New York. I graduated from the State University of New York at Albany, went on to Cornell University, where I attained my Master's of Professional Studies in African and African American History. I was mentored by Dr. James Turner, who taught me the utmost importance of scholarship and activism. I'm a community organizer, journalist, professor, hip hop activist, and the 2008 Green Party vice presidential candidate. I love hip hop. I was born in hip hop. I spent my childhood years in park jams. I try to use the culture of hip hop as a tool of resistance, but I've recognized that that tool has been turned against the very founders of the culture, working class and poor youth of color, particularly African Americans, Puerto Ricans, and Jamaicans. As my friend Hector Rivera says, one of the founders of the group, well, the welfare poets. If hip hop organized, the whole world would be in trouble. Hip hop culture, a worldwide cultural and political phenomenon that is over 30 years old. Hip hop transcends language and borders. There are millions of people worldwide that can be defined as first and second generation hip hoppers. Hip hop is often tapped as a cultural, political, economic, and electoral force. Hip hop is a platform for political activists, culture workers, and community organizers that make up the entire hip hop generation. This show will pay special attention to intergenerational dialogues, international politics, women's issues, and third party electoral politics. All five elements of the culture will be highlighted, but this show will focus on the fifth element, knowledge, culture, and politics, and hopefully add a much needed sixth element, hip hop emancipatory journalism, with guidance from Dr. Jared Ball. Hip Hop State of Mind will attempt to fill the gap within left and progressive media in which the stories of this generation are either ignored or rarely given opportunities to speak for themselves. As independent media in this country grows, we hope to carve out a public space in which members of the hip hop generation can help shape and influence the discourse within progressive and left movements all around the world. Before we kick off this new venture, there's a few people we want to thank, or as in hip hop, as we say, we want to give a couple of shout outs. To everyone at Free Speech TV for believing and understanding the necessity for a hip hop political talk show. Thank you to Don Rojas, who believed in this from the first pitch, and to Herb Boyd for helping me find a home for this project. Everyone at Grit TV, thank you for hosting us in your studios, and much love to Laura Flanders for her generosity, mentorship, and support. Many of my friends who contributed to the making of this show, Stickman of Dead Prez for our theme song, Jackie Suhan of Big Noise Films for our opening montage, and Two Fly, an extraordinary graffiti artist who has designed our logo, our design. Much gratitude goes out to Mari Nevis Alba, Joyce Jones, Kesawam and Khalil Amustafa, as well as the Rebel Diaz Arts Collective, who have been with us since the beginning, and all those in the hip hop community that have already shown their support. We encourage you to share this show with your family, your community, your people. It is our sincere wish that you join us every week. Coming up on today's show, a one-on-one -on -one interview with M1, one half of the hip hop duo Dead Prez. He just returned from the Existence is Resistance Hip Hop Tour in Palestine, a discussion with MC and cultural ambassador Tony Blackman and Pop Master Fable of Rocksteady Crew and Zulu Nation. What do they think of the state of hip hop culture and politics? And we end the show with a tribute to the Puerto Rican nationalist hero Lolita Lebron. Stay tuned. Tony Blackman's work is both domestic and global in nature. Her experiences as a diplomatic worker enables her to move through various communities, arts, political circles, international gatherings, youth groups, academia, and the music industry. 
An award-winning artist, her steadfast work and commitment to hip-hop led the U.S. Department of State to select her to work as the first ever hip-hop artist as an American cultural specialist. Tony Blackman is a worldwide cultural ambassador. She has traveled to over 25 countries to give workshops, lectures, and performances. She runs Rhyme Like a Girl workshops for celebrity DJ Beverly Bond's Black Girl Rock program and recently featured her collective at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Jorge Pavon, a.k.a. Pop Master Favor, was born and raised in Spanish Harlem. Favor developed his pioneering dance and choreography career at hip-hop jams and clubs throughout New York City. He has appeared in several documentaries and films, including the hip-hop cult classic, Beat Street. He is working on a documentary titled Apache Line from Gangs to Hip Hop. So welcome Tony Blackman, Pop Master Fable. Thank you for being the first guest on the first show of Hip Hop State of Mind. I appreciate the time. And I really just want to have a, a big discussion, overall discussion. What is the state of hip hop? Mm -hmm. How you feeling about what's going on in Arizona? How are we feeling about the fact that Wyclef may be running for president of Haiti? <laughs> you know, I just want to get into it. Um, so, Tony, worldwide ambassador. I mean, I think I met you, it's been over a decade now. Right. But yeah. I see so much of your work lately being about how we can get a new, younger generation mm -hmm. of women mm -hmm. to not only be hip-hop MCs, but activists and, and really take right. control of their lives. So if you could just share with, with the audience, with us, how did you, when did you fall in love with hip hop? When did you know you could be part of, of, of this great cultural phenomenon? And then you've obviously seen it right. worldwide where yeah. a lot of us haven't been able to travel to over 27 countries. Well, you know, I, I fell in love with hip hop. I started out popping and locking. Oh, yeah. And, um, that I know. <laughs> yeah, I did. And that was um, my first connection to the music. And I started rhyming, ironically, I was a cheerleader. And I was in charge of the rallies for basketball right. season. And that's when I started rhyming. I can so, relate. I was a cheerleader. Oh, you were too? I, was, <laughs> yeah. I actually uh, won some championships. How did you? <laughs> I won the Spirit Award, of oh, course. Yay. You know, But um, I, I started rap changing lyrics to songs, and um, popular songs, and using them for the rallies. And then I realized that the audience connected with me. And, and I tried to quit in graduate school. My grandmother was dying of cancer on her deathbed, said, you need to leave this alone and go get your PhD. And I tried, I really tried, but hip hop kept calling me. And so um, I think some of us choose hip hop and some of us hip hop chooses us. That's right. And so, and, and, and I imagine like Bahama Dia, she says like, girl, I'm gonna put this mic down when I'm old and gray and can mm -hmm. barely walk. And I really believe her. And I never thought that would be me. Yeah. But but here I am once again with the hip hop people. <laughs> I mean, you know, one of your my favorite quotes from you mm -hmm. comes out of Byron Hurt's movie Beyond Hip Hop, um, mm -hmm. Beyond Beats, Beats and Rhymes. Rhymes. Yeah. And it opens up with this shot of you and you say, you know, hip hop is like a domestic violence relationship. Oh, yeah. You know, and yeah. um, as much as I've shown the movie, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to me that is a resounding moment, especially for women. This relationship that you love, that you fight for, that you right. struggle with, yeah. that you co-created, yeah. that is sometimes painful and hurtful. And I wonder if you could talk about that and how it really relates to your personal work and in, in working with young women in hip hop. Well, it's interesting because that I have like 20 second quote in that movie yeah. and hundreds of people have mentioned that idea of hip hop and how for me it was it's been an abusive relationship at times. Mm -hmm. And um, what it did was it challenged me to get to know myself and to take a stand for myself and to learn how to honor my voice and not just preach it. Because we activists can be very self-righteous about what's right and wrong. And we can be very self-righteous about being confident and taking a stand, but inside be extremely insecure. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, as I look back now, and as I've undergone all kinds of healing therapies and modalities and sitting at the feet of traditional hands-on healers, like I had to go through it, a lot of it was because of what I experienced through hip hop. But hip hop just became like a microcosm for real life. Yeah. and the bigger world and because this was my world it just happened to be hip-hop and 
I've been inspired to work with girls and young women and my peers around this idea of us owning our space within this culture and remaining a part of the conversation. And I think Dr. Uh, Kira Gant, she had said one time when I heard her speak, and she says, what happens is too often, we women who love hip hop, we leave the conversation. Right. And we leave and we go away angry. And it's like a wife who has a, a beef with her husband and doesn't tell him why she's mad. Mm -hmm. You know, she doesn't stay to work it out. She mm -hmm. just She just exits the room. And so that's what the work with Rhyme Like a Girl is about and with the cypher with female MCs, and we're actually planning in later this month to use the movie Pray the Devil Back to Hell yes. about the women in Liberia, to use that as a conversation piece to bring together these different cliques of female MCs so that they begin to understand that those women, if they could fight that, surely we could change hip hop. It's interesting that you say about women leaving because I think a lot of people that we are acquaintances with have left the culture, mm, yeah, you know, yeah. and, like, and because of, of abuse, yeah. uh, they're not sure where they fit in. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these issues. And I'm wondering what makes you give particularly energy to younger girls within hip hop, but also the larger American culture that really in the last 10 years through mainstream media culture has devalued the worth of a female period. Right. Like, yeah. how does that work? Yeah. And, and how do you relate your personal experiences to them, to, to empower them? Well, it is a challenge because I've had, I've had younger women literally just walk away from this whole movement after me investing six, five, seven, eight years of mentorship into them and thinking that one, either they had to quit and leave it alone altogether or two, they needed to get a little sexier, you know, find the right dudes to ally with and leave all these chicks alone. And um, it's been a struggle. It is not easy at all. But one of the things that I like to talk about and focus on is if we keep leaving the table, there will be no food for anyone to eat. And I also like to focus on the existence of hip hop is actually, it's still alive because of women, because of women. Right. And we don't look at how many women are producing like the DJ battles who are organizing the B-boy summits and events the women that are the managers and the runners and the tour managers. There are so many women that are integral parts of hip hop. And if you create like the a dialogue where these younger women can see that, because when they show up to an event, they see who's running things. Well, when we sh when most events are always female full and led and run and support it, you know. Right. And a lot of the spaces you're talking about still relate to two or three elements of the culture. We have, right. you know, as well as you're right. an activist, an organized right. journalist, you yeah. know, especially female journalists, yeah. you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the work, though, now has to go to these younger girls, 12, 13, 14, maybe even earlier. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. And I, and I think and they, they have things that they want to say. And you know what I love about the younger guys? What? There's a certain baggage that they want to have, but they don't. <laughs> and if you come at them, like, strong, they listen. Well, like in the movie, at the yeah. end, the ending shot is you freestyling and dropping 16 bars on a, about six dudes who could yeah. not come back and battle. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, that, I mean, it's a great <laughs> moment. You had two amazing moments yeah. in that film, and I think that film's seven years old, and it, that yeah. moment that you were in it really mm -hmm. resounds. But yeah. now, you know, to Fable, because um, it, Tony mentioned women, especially around DJ culture and, and just the culture of hip hop, and with your wife, Christy Favon, you guys have tools of war. So I do want to talk about that, but you know, you've always been someone within the culture that I think a lot of women say you're not patriarchal, paternalistic. What is the strength of this woman and how can I help them find it? Whether it's the activist, the B-girl, B-boy, graph artist. You know, I mean, you were there when hip hop was founded. <laughs> you're in the Bronx. What do you think is the state of hip hop as it relates to women? Well, you know, first off, I was actually born and raised in Spanish Harlem, and I spent a lot of time in the Bronx. A lot of people think I was from there. But I think, like, my understanding and my respect towards women really started at home, because I was raised by, by my mom. My father bounced when I was four years old. 
So I was raised by a mother and two older sisters, mm -hmm. and it's me and a twin brother. So um, I learned respect quick be it via cocotazo, bofeta, <laughs> whatever it took chancleta. for them. Chancleta, you already know. I know. Whatever it took to, to you know, make sure that we weren't going to be, uh, you know, misogynist and, you know, there's always uh, some kind of machismo that comes with, especially so-called Latinos, you know. Um, but, you know, when I met Christy, who is my wife, Christy Z, who ran the DMC battles, mm -hmm. uh, the DJ battles, you know, in the late 90s. Um, then she took a little leave of absence, and now she runs the USA DMC again. When I met her, you know, I met her with an understanding that, you know, women are, number one, extremely powerful. Number two, n you know, for a conscious man, never try to disempower a woman. You know, let her do her thing. How does yeah. that work when you're in spaces that, you know, what happens when you're, you're at an event and you see that go down? You know, to someone that you may be a mentor to. I know that me and Christy have had conversations where it's happened uh, to her. You know, how does that work for you as a man to maybe not step in to save the woman, but to I, definitely... I got to damn near chain myself to a fence somewhere. <laughs> because I want to jump in, you know? Right. That's my nature, to protect her and all that other stuff that comes with being a husband, being a man. But, you know, I, I give her her space to defend herself. You know, she's pretty good at it. She's very sincere, you know? She's, you know, and uh, I think her message is pretty clear. I'm trying to help this culture, you know? I, and, and she plays her position, actually. I play mine. When it comes to what she does, I play my position. But in the, in the scope of the big picture, she plays hers as well. She knows that, you know, she didn't grow up here. She grew up in Pennsylvania. You know, her dream was always to live, you know, experience hip hop and its pure and its purity, uh, about as close as we could get now in 2010, you know, in the years that I've known her. And somehow she managed to make that happen, you know. So, so because of all that, I, I really just, I, I stand back, you know, I fall back, I let her do her thing, I let her defend herself. And when I feel that it reaches a point where it's necessary that I step in, I do it then. But aside from that, she's more than capable of, you know, right reasoning and, and letting people know what her intentions are. And to this, to this point, I think the people that at least are conscious of her efforts understand that she means no harm. All she wants to do is preserve this culture just like me. Mm -hmm. And basically, we're a team in that aspect, you know, <coughs> in that regard. And, now, and you guys, <coughs> through Tools of War, have been doing, I think this is the eighth year. Eighth year, yeah. of, of the hip hop jams. Um, the new, the la last one was at Cotona Park this Right, and the next one will this be. This past Thursday. Right, and now every Tuesday in August, we'll be in St. Nicholas Park. Um, on 135th Street, St. Nicholas, every Tuesday from 4.30 to 8.30. And you know, her, her game plan basically was to highlight the DJ again. You know, well, I mean, I feel like you guys brought the essence of what, how hip hop started, the idea of the park jam. And I, I know that you've had to deal with things that you didn't have to deal with in 1979, 1980, the amount of police and permits and all this, but right. obviously, the community is so invested in these park jams and they're so necessary. And what I found to be incredible about them is the intergenerational connection. That now you have people like us who have families and babies, this second, third generation of hip hop, coming together intergenerationally to have, as Be Africa Bambada would say, fun, you right, know, peace right. and love. But in, you know, you, you, you're within Rocksteady Crew, you know, it's Zulu Nation. And you're within these collectives that have just enormous world dry res respect. I mean, people know who you are, you know. Uh, I think last year the crew was on Dancing with the Stars, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, you're wa and you're like, that's crazy, Lakes. This is incredible. How do you stay grounded and accessible? That's what I'm always curious about, and I think a lot of people are. You're accessible to the community, and I mean, you're fable. You, you could be at a whole different kind of isolated level. 
But what politically or what was it with, with you within hip hop that keeps you grounded like that? Well, you know, in Spanish we say, yo soy con la gente. I'm, I'm a people person, you know. I'm in the trenches. But I have to rewind because you mentioned a few things. One thing is that, you know, we get a lot of help. You know, we get help from friends at Cotona. You know, it's not just a tools of war thing. Yes. Friends at Cotona help us. We have community organizations that understand what we're doing is good. And we the Bronx Borough President, Ruben right, Diaz Jr., right. I mean, who's and, been known as the hip hop assembly man. Joel yeah. Rivera as well. So we get yeah, support, political, important. you know, support. Also, there are um, some precincts that, they're like the 42nd, that also, you know, uh, look out for us and they understand what we're doing and they know what we're up against, the people that sell nutcrackers, all that stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so it's not really an easy thing to, uh, to maintain, but somehow we found a way. Um, regarding, you know, I mean, I don't like to toot my own horn, but obviously I think, you know, Christie's, Christie masterminding these park jams, you know, I, you know, she was the brains and I was kind of like the muscle behind it, yeah. you know, and my reputation sort of helped with it. Like, okay, wow, that's, that's Christie's husband, you know, we can't violate her. And on top of that, you know, I have my whole Zulus there. We got the black spades, you know. We have, I mean, and uh, also I feel like you're the bridge. I feel um, some of us play certain roles. I feel in, in, in political activism, I may be that bridge of black and brown, black and Puerto Rican, you know, although we, we may identify as black Puerto Ricans or that uh, indigenous, but that's, that's you've, been that, you, you've been that bridge, you know, and, and there's been tough times within hip hop when the co-creators of it battle against each other for space and you mm -hmm. know, how, how do you continue to see that as an, a necessary part of hip hop, continue to bridge that gap, particularly between black and brown? Well, you know, I mean, for those who, who aren't conscious, you know, obviously they see a difference. For those of us who are conscious, we see it all as something from Africa, you know, and something indigenous, be it Taino, or, or Aztec or Mayan or whatever. The point is that, you know, indigenous people have had this funky rhythm that, you know, surpassed, you know, ages and, and transcended, you know, race, religion, all that, ethnicities. Right. Um, you know, yes, at one point, I remember when I first started popping, they would look at me and say, hey, yo, <laughs> Goya, shouldn't you be doing salsa? You know, and, and, you know, I took offense to it when I was a kid and I wasn't conscious. And, you know, I'd be like, wow, I'm going to get real good. I'm, I'm going to battle that dude, you know, whether he's black. I don't care what color he is, but we're going to battle one day when I get good. And then at the same time that I, you know, sharpened my popping sword, you know, I sharpened my, my, you know, sword in the mind where I started to understand, like, wow, actually, we're all one, you know. We're, we're Afro-Caribbean. And what a lot of people say, like, there's some people that would say, oh, you Latinos jumped on the bandwagon. Right. And I'm like... Really, we did, how's that? But hey, we dance mambo, we dance rumba, bomba, plena, all that derives from some African roots, you know? I'm like, how did, on what bandwagon did we jump on? Uh, if it is, if it's, <coughs> if anything, we're like two wheels on that wagon. I mean, we yeah. are, I mean, Puerto yeah. Ricans particularly, we are co-creators of the of culture. Of hip hop culture, absolutely, yeah. and nobody could deny it. So. So once people have an understanding of, you know, um, Afro-Caribbean um, roots and culture and what we did and how we came into the game, um, you know, you have, you know, documentaries like Mambo Madness, where you got, you know, Puerto Rican guys in the Palladium doing, you know, front sweeps and these, like, breakdancing movies. In the 30s and 40s, and that, that right. movie is amazing because it also speaks about the electric boogaloo, and, right, you know, you just right. see well, the It was just the boogaloo back then. We <laughs> added electric oh, later. Added electric yeah, boogaloo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. you know, electric boogaloo came from Boogaloo Sam, Pop and Pete from the West Coast. But the point is that there eventually came an understanding you know, and, and, and although there was some, a little bit of animosity back then, you know, and not all, all the time, because look, Dizzy Gillespie and, and, and Machito, mm -hmm. you know, started popping it off with, with Latin jazz, you know? Then you got guys like that came after, Joe Cuba with Latin Boogaloo, you know, Pete Mongo Rodriguez, San, Mongo, Santa, Mongo Maria. Santa Maria, right. Then after that came Joe Batan, 
you know, and then after that came groups like Mandrill. And then Fa you know? and Fania. Right, I mean, Fania All Stars. Fania All Stars. The Last Poets. You had a Puerto Rican there. His name is Felipe, Felipe Luciano. Luciano. Yeah. Right. And, the, so, and then we could look at the welfare poets and this kind of trajectory that doesn't begin at the inception of hip hop that day at Sedgwick or Bronx River Houses. Right, it precedes you know? all of that. Yeah. But before yeah. we close up, I got like this lightning round. You know, I've been, <laughs> it, it, you know, these politics, right? Let's go Amazing. for it. Amazing. Let's go for it. Um, Sean Bell's family um, and, and Trent Benefield and uh, uh, Guzman, I, I, I can't recall the brother's first name, uh, just received a $7 million settlement uh, for the killing of Sean Bell. And, you know, obviously some people say it's justice. Just your thoughts on that payout. I'll go after you. Yeah, well, I don't... I, the justice piece, like I saw that and I saw the little thing online and I didn't feel a sense of a resolve or peace right. about the issue and um, life is priceless first of all and yes. then Thank second you. of all when yes. it comes to the issue of police brutality in New York City particularly, I think justice would be an authentic conversation from the powers that be about what occurred and how to prevent it uh. from happening again. Like that would feel like justice, you know, um, t alongside this check. It, it would, and it would feel more fair and it would feel, it, it would just feel fair. It would feel like justice. Like, and I feel like uh, from your international travels, you've been, yeah. and I'm sure you've seen some of these kind of truth and reconciliation you yeah. know, um, tribunals or where people come together. And right. I think that, I think you're right. That would be uh, justice. Okay, they gave, you know, Sean Bell and all that. They're starting to find some form of justice through monetary, yeah. you know, um, the equivalent of a life through money. Uh, honestly, like she said, a, a human life is priceless. Okay, now those are the guys that, you know, the, the, the so-called police officers that did that, were busted and justice was served to a degree. How about the ones where that didn't happen? How could you put a price on the hundreds of people that were murdered by the cops? Right. You know what I mean? I've been to police protests and all that. I've seen mothers crying mm -hmm. from bias to all of that. I mean, we just I had mean, Oscar Grant, you know, and the fact yeah. that, yeah. you know, he, this cop gets, uh, in, uh, involuntary manslaughter and now the postponing of him going to jail. I mean, you've been through it. I, I mean, Anthony Bias, Diallo, Doris Mon, I mean, you know, and I, I'm glad you bring that up about it. These are the high profile cases, right. but we the just had the recent report in the New York Times that tells us in one section of Brooklyn, Brownsville, we have 52,000 stops and frisks. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the the murder, the 41 shots, the 50 shots, it's the everyday harassment that black and brown people, now with including women, right. are, are dealing with. I mean, women are being brutalized by the police now, which is a kind of a new phenomenon, mm -hmm. although women have always been sexually assaulted, and right. we've dealt with those issues too, but yeah. Well, well you know, what I want to get on is a solution. Yeah. You what, know, what what's the that? solution? What do you think I mean, we could complain <clears throat> all day, but I'm saying, I would say, and this is just me guessing off the top, yeah. definitely more than 50% of the police officers aren't trained properly. Right. right. Number yeah. one, right. you got people out there, you know, that, that just barely made the cut, you mm -hmm. know, and I know because I, I got eyes and I see. So it starts with that. Once they properly start training police officers to do their job, job properly, then maybe we wouldn't have some of this excess you know, police gang activity. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it's starting to look like to me. Yeah. You know, Giuliani, you know, for, for the sake of, you know, uh, quality of life and what have you, the pendulum swung from one extreme to the other. Right. And in the process, he kind of created a gang mm. that, had, that wears patches like me, except their patches are legal. Right, the gang in blue. You right. know, and I, and I, I, f I think what, what we also have to deal with, I'm wondering if you feel the same way, is that many older people in our community see the police as a good force. You right. know, I mean, we're dealing with issues in our community that are not safe. Crime, you know, 
we living in the Bronx, Brooklyn, gunshots all night. We're living in high unemployment. Right. The idea of mass incarceration as public policy also. But these, you know, older folks who are like, well, you know, we like the police. And, you know, if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be safe. How do we have that? How well, do we transition? Who's going to protect us from them? I think that's the, well, that's yeah, the solution that's the we need. Right. Right. Do we deal with There's what community policing could really look like? Proper training and screening, and every three months, a psychological evaluation, okay. physical evaluation, because I see half of them running around 300 plus pounds. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah. to knock on someone's size, <laughs> but, true. but that's where the long arm or the law comes. Right. And they'll yeah. pop you first because they, they can't even they can't chase fight. you down they and apprehend you. Yeah. All right, so look, I'm going to keep it real talk right here, man. Now, we want to jump into, um, into Arizona. Mm -hmm. It's a whole nother similar problem. Well, yeah, let's finish on Arizona. I mean, right. we travel the world. We're, mm -hmm. we're, I mean, we're dealing with what I believe to be is institutionalized racism yes. as public policy. Mm -hmm. And the fact that these um, Republicans, there's a lot of Democrats, I mean, are okay with this. Right. Yeah. You know, the fact that hate crimes, we just had one last night here in New York in Staten Island. Mm -hmm. The scary part is the hate crimes are now being perpetrated by African-American youth, mm -hmm. you know. But, yeah, Arizona, I mean, to yeah. end from both go of your perspectives, it. yeah, where I do we go from here? Well, it's like Arizona is like, it's, it's like the truth tube, you know, on, on Dr. Oz is the truth tube about <laughs> your health, like what's really going right. down with you and that food. Yeah. It's like the truth tube. And you, if you look at what's happening in Arizona, it's like it reveals the pulse of what's really going on in our country, in the land of the free, in the home of the brave. And where people are not brave, they're afraid. Mm -hmm. And everybody's scared of the next man and afraid of what they're gonna lose and afraid of what they're not gonna get and afraid of what they don't have. And it's, it's the frightening part is that it is okay with so many people. And that, that we've, so many people have been brainwashed and programmed to believe that there's somebody taking something from them, as if there's this, there's this scarcity complex, which has not just to do with politics, but also with a, a sort of um, a spiritual starvation. Mm. Like there's like an emptiness of the soul, where how can a person who praises God actually look at themselves in the mirror and say that it is okay to not allow this child to be educated and go to school, that it is okay to not have this pregnant woman be taken care of. That it is okay. It, it's it's almost it's disturbing. Like it's disturbing, and it's mm -hmm. and in some ways it's 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 like racism is a disease, and it's a sickness, and um, it's actually it's hard. I get frustrated emotionally to like talk about it, like intellectually. I mean, well, I mean, you're doing a great job. Because yeah. I, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we can't just talk <laughs> about these things on paper. These are yeah. our lives. This is us. Yeah, I mean, yeah. especially as people of color. I mean, yeah, what does it yeah, matter yeah. when I drop into Arizona and I'm Puerto Rican? That's right. not the issue. Right. The yeah. issue is hate amongst yeah. the new, what I call racial boogie man, woman, brown right. people in this right. country. When it comes to Arizona, like, honestly, you know, I, I heard a different side of the story that, you know, people were coming in from Mexico selling drugs, and then there was like a big, you know, problem there with that. Um, I don't live in Arizona, so I don't see firsthand what happens every day. Right. I don't see the issues like I can I can mm -hmm. talk about New York. I live here. I was born mm -hmm. and raised here. Um, but to be honest, you know, unless you're indigenous, everyone is a visitor here. Right. So, you know, who's, you know, who ha really has the authority to stop a family mm -hmm. from, you know, back in the days there were no passports. You know what I mean? So I know it might sound sort of like primitive thinking, but... That's what I believe, you know. They, they have anyone who, you know, be it illegally or legally, actually, you know, most of the people that founded this so-called country are all illegally here, are all illegally here because someone other than Europeans ran this country. So, okay, we can get into, you know, might means right or whatever and the state of affairs we're in right now, okay? Bottom line is this, you know, you, you can walk into Arizona and start racially profiling people, not knowing that there's centuries of their folk that have been there, mm. that have been there for a long time. 
grandfathers, great grandfathers, great great grandfathers, great grandmothers, etc. So really, I mean, come on, what are we talking about here? You know, I mean, and, and it happens here. I get stopped. I get stopped in New York. I mean, soon that was like a blueprint mm -hmm. for what they're probably going to try to spread throughout the rest of the nation. Well, yes, yeah, since SB 1070 was um, uh, written and uh, implemented on July 29th, parts of it, you have 20, if not 24, other states picking up on the policy. We'll skip the, mm. the questions on who voted and all that for maybe the after show, or we'll have people Twitter, Facebook, <laughs> or Tony, do you, you could close it out. If you want to say <laughs> or not, it's up to yeah. you. You want to close it out? Well, you know, I, I voted. Will I vote in the next election? I would feel bad not voting. Right. Um, I tell because I missed that election when Gore lost. Like, I, I forgot and I felt so well, when, guilty when, when Bush. When the, but it was, again, I felt it so was bad. a stolen election. It was stolen. But you it still felt stolen. bad for not having But your I still one feel bad. <laughs> yeah. And so that's what pressed Twice me. Stolen. <laughs> Twice stolen. Twice. Yeah. And so the reality, but then the reality of, I'm at this stage where I understand that politics are important, that politics must be discussed. But I'm also at this stage where my creativity, um, it's almost like politics kills it and squashes it because it's, it can be so painful to confront the reality of our situation. And I think that's why so that I know some people who won't vote, who don't vote, right. who don't want to talk about politics, who don't want to see a political show. And it's like this, um, it's like when something bad is happening and you want to close, cover your ears, but that doesn't mean it's not happening. And so I'm coming out of a phase where I, I was sitting in the dark, like, and everything's getting whacker as the years go by, but I'm sitting there like, no, nah, you know, that stuff is stressful, it's, it's, it's unfair. And it's like, we have to be able to begin to have these conversations around voting, whether or not it works, if it doesn't work, what are we gonna do to make it different? Mm -hmm. And around holding the politicians who do win accountable, even if that wasn't someone you voted for. Right. And um, being able to have critiques that are productive, not just attacks, so that we don't end up looking like the other, um, those attacking people who are doing their thing right now. Um, but being constructive, because if we allow what's going on now to continue the way it is continuing, you know what's, what's inevitable. Well, um, I mean, it's right in front of us now, and yeah. I think that's the great thing about hip-hop culture, you know, that we have these five elements, and yeah. some of us participate in all five, some of us participate in the political aspect, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's all connected, you yeah. know, so, well, I just want to say thank you so much to Tony Blackman, Pop, Pop Master Fable, mm -hmm. um, for joining us. You guys could be found on, on Facebook and, mm -hmm. and Twitter and all yeah. of that. We'll put up the information on the show's website and I just want to thank you for being our first guest to kick off this uh, I, what I think is going to be an amazing collective project of hip-hop politics and debate and talk all over the country so thank you for joining me. Thank you. And we're excited for you and proud of yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. And joining us via Skype from Miami, Florida is M1 of the hip-hop group Dead Prez, also a well-known international activist who just returned from Palestine. He went on the Existence is Resistance hip-hop tour, and we're so happy to have him here um, from Miami, Florida. Matulu, how are you doing? How are you doing? Doing fantastic, and Rosa, thank you for having me here for this uh, fantastic occasion, hosting uh, this initial uh, show. So thank you, 100%. Well, thank you for being with us. So, M, you just got back from Palestine literally two days ago. Can you tell us a little bit about the tour? And this is your second visit in less than one year. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, I think it may, may have been, it's right around a year. Um, I got to say um, that Existence is Resistance uh, has been doing a fantastic job of enabling um, hip-hop artists to get engaged to uh, what's going on um, in the so-called Middle East and definitely uh, with the, the siege against Palestine um, in a very clear way. So it has been a, a, a very uh, useful conduit uh, for myself 
and hopefully I can carry some of the experiences I've had in Gaza last year and now in, in the West Bank this year, I, I can carry some of that over and impart some of that to some of my, some of my comrades uh, in, in, in this hip hop game, you know. So Matulu, you just returned um, back from the West Bank. What, what is something that um, you think people here in, in the United States, but particularly those within the hip hop generation, may not know about what's going on in Palestine right now? Um, I, I, I can tell you uh, what you may not know is going on in Palestine uh, is connected with the blackout uh, or should I say the media whiteout that we've been given the whole while. I think people are generally aware of this kind of uh, displacement of Palestinian people, um, which, which is, of course, even according to Barack Obama, uh, is, is goes against people's human rights, uh, the Palestinian human rights, but yet it continues. But what people might not know is how brutal um, Zionism or the Zionist brand of imperialism is every day uh, for, for Palestinian people. Just having to pass through the, uh, the, the, the checkpoint that, that separates Ramallah and Haifa or, or that area um, that leads into Ramallah is uh, the difference in night and day. Um, you can tell where the end of American spending uh, happens and then the beginning of a uh, war lifestyle that, that's lived by uh, Palestinian people who basically are living in open-air prison, fighting for um, every day their right to live and buying, basically being pimped for in a plantation style, uh, every little thing that they get that they have to buy from the Israeli side. Um, you know, uh, it, it is the brutality uh, of it that I think people are not seeing every day. And, uh, you know, if I had to deliver anything, it's just that uh, the, the resistance is still high. Um, that the resistance is still high because, you know, uh, that's the side that you don't hear from. And, and you're working within hip hop culture and what a lot of people in the world might not know, a lot of people who don't know all these amazing elements of hip hop culture, particularly the fifth element, um, knowledge, culture, and politics. How was it to be there with all these young people, older people being in ciphers, rhyming, them? them talking about their experience, really using hip hop as a voice of resistance at, to give voice to those that are voiceless in Palestine. What made you hopeful? Well, I mean, well, first of all, I got to give um, big thanks to Existence is Resistance. All of you who don't know who this organization is, uh, you know, get it. Uh, I believe that questions at uh, existenceisresistance.org. Uh, check that with Miriam, uh, Amen, uh, Nancy Mansour, uh, these are some fantastic leadership that has led us in this direction and made it possible for us to do little things like workshops, which added up to so much. Um, we were in refugee camps. I guess you can call them refugee camps. Um, they were basically internment camps from people who had been displaced from their land that Israel had taken over into places in uh, Nablus and Jenin, which are huge resistance camps inside Palestine borders. So inside those places, we were able to go and uh, uh, through uh, a re really great translation process from Arabic uh, into our, our English, and some artists were from the UK, so then a different kind of brand of English as well, um, to be able to talk about just that, hip hop in all of its five elements. Um, we brought um, break dancers there from Chicago, Illinois, and, and graffiti writers who uh, we were able to write freedom slogans, and uh, of course in Arabic and, and, um, and, and in the language that we speak, uh, the common language of hip-hop music all over the walls. Um, we did MC from the basic groups where I was able to talk about Melly Mel and Grandmaster Cash and, and uh, you know, uh, all the greats that we know, uh, all my family uh, from the Bronx. And, uh, and then we were able to do shows um, that were resistance from all levels, levels um, not just, you know, M1 from Dead Press, but Shadi Mansour, who is a uh, Palestinian, uh, you know, who, who's been living in the UK, and Loki. Who's uh, also a supporter of Palestinian rights? Who has Iranian descent? So I mean, you know, we, we there was a number of people from different angles to be able to communicate, get 
before we let you go, um, you know, you came back to a lot of news, um, if you didn't hear. Just your thoughts and opinions on uh, this potential run of Wyclef Jean uh, for president of Haiti. What are you thinking about that? Well, I mean, um, you know, I, I think you have, you have to make a thorough examination of politics in Haiti today. And uh, first, before you do anything, I think you have to understand what Haiti has been against and, and the, the government and the people's uh, choice for president uh, in Aristide, who has been ousted uh, uh, because of the, you, you know, the U.S. interest, uh, Bill Clinton's interest, uh, Bush's interest, and Obama's interest in Haiti uh, are the reason why the people uh, can't be self-determining in Haiti right now. So when you even begin to talk about white left John, um, it's laughable. Just even when we talk about the, the hip-hop community having a, a, a clear uh, directive as to what a, a politic is out of a hip-hop music or music itself. Um, I've said it before, um, you know, just because you can rap doesn't mean you can be the leader of our families and our communities. It takes much more organization skills and a worldview especially when we're talking about a place called Haiti. So, and, and just, just to add on this, most people who have done much more research than I, but even to the layman hip-hop person, if we just study who Wyclef's father and grandfather were and the roles that they played in leading coups, the coups that were assisted and aided by, that they, they were ambassadors by the U.S. government, um, it doesn't look, I guess it look, the fairy doesn't look very pretty. Um, to me. So I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, from BOCC, from Fred Hampton Jr., if we say no, re no if we have no research, then we have no right to speak, no investigation, no right to speak. Uh, I think people don't need to chime in until they figure out exactly the role that Black Left has been playing in the past. Uh, I'm not talking about posturing, I'm not talking about making songs that are, you know, uh, at most opportunistic, uh, which is the role that he's played in the recent years in Haiti struggle, a very uh, a not revolutionary role, if I can say that. Um, and this isn't a strike against black left. It's an examination of exactly who he is in reality. He's not a revolutionary. Uh, so then the role that he's looking to play in Haiti is to do what? Is, 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 is it to aid the U.S. takeover of, uh, and, and to turn it into a playground and resort ground that they have um, insisted that it become in the, in the last few years? or continue the resistance of people like Toussaint Louverture. Um, I leave that to the people to make um, to make their final choice, but I know the Haitian people are not fools. Yeah, um, I mean, there's already I, been there's already been statements coming out. There's a lot of young people that already put the research in, so I think it is critical that within hip-hop at this age that we have a critical analysis. So as we close out and we celebrate M, um, Black August, which our next show next week will be a whole show dedicated to the tradition of Black August. On yeah. um, uh, Sunday, August 1st, 2010, at the age of 90, Lolita Lebron um, passed away. Your thoughts on, on Lolita and um, your closing thoughts on, on this continuing struggle for social justice worldwide? Well, I mean, uh, I think it's important that we
Thank you for thank. Oh, so M1 of Dead Press. Thank you for your work. Thank you for joining us from Miami, Florida. We'll see you in New York in a couple of weeks. And as always, um, comrade, my brother, my friend, we send you revolutionary love, and we'll see you soon in New York City. Okay. Uhuru. Uhuru. As we close out today's show, we celebrate the life and legacy of Puerto Rican independista leader Lolita Lebron, who made her transition on Sunday, August 1st, at the age of 90 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Lolita said, my life I give for the freedom of my country. The United States of America is betraying the sacred principles of mankind and their continuous subjugation of my country. I am a revolutionary. I did not come to die, I came to live. I had the honor of meeting Doña Lolita on May 1st, 2003 in Vieques, Puerto Rico. I was there covering the U.S. Naval withdrawal from the island for WBAI radio. I was able to interview her, walk with her, hold my hand with her as tens of thousands of Boricuas and other people on midnight broke those fences down and reclaimed the territory of Vieques. I will never forget that moment. I will cherish it forever. We close today's show with a tribute to Doña Lolita Lebron. Palante, siempre palante. Now to the musical tribute of Lolita by hip hop MC Maria Isa. Tree 
city of the NY. Baruch Projects, yo, the Lower East Side. All the way to the light blue. Vega Baja Santo, se vaya monti, señor, the Ponce Skies. Let the drum squad maracas ride, dancer right the side. The curandero santeros to clear my mind. Along with the turntables, Boricos been rock steady, crewing like we was pop master fable. Hip hop, rock, a bella, now a reggaeton, se que blow afuera de la isla, and no one is stable. Securing that the culture won't get knocked down. Hip Hop State of Mind is sponsored by Free Speech TV and Grit TV. We are commercial free and stay on the air with your support. Please help us grow. Hit the PayPal button on our site. Every dollar does count. We are on Direct TV channel 348 and Link TV channel 3415. If you want to bring us to your community, college TV, or radio station, contact us at info at rosaclemente.org. You can follow us on Twitter. Our address is Hip Hop Mind State. Find us on Facebook, Hip Hop State of Mind. And please visit our website, www.rosaclemente.org. Until next week, this is Rosa Clemente. We thank you for joining us on this new journey. <laughs>